I'm thankful that somebody cared enough about me to teach me to say Psalm 23 by heart, uh, particularly that phrase, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. How pleasant to come to church on a spring Sunday and encounter an old friend. Sometimes Sunday uh, can be a jarring, discordant experience. If you settle down into the pew only to be hit over the head by some unfamiliar idea, some alien biblical text, poked in the ribs by a pushy preacher peddling an even pushier biblical passage. <laughs> well, hey, not this Sunday. No, this Sunday, uh, uh, we're, we're at the 23rd Psalm, and it, it offers us a meeting with an old familiar friend. And, and carries us way back into the quaint, bygone world of sheep and shepherds. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack for nothing. I can't remember when I did not know the song. Can, can you? Even if a person knows no scripture by heart, can't find a verse when he needs it, there's a good chance he knows this one. I see the faded pastel picture from my third grade Sunday school class. Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Psalm 23 is a psalm of children, expressing a childlike trust in God's ability to protect us, just like a shepherd. Here is the God who leads us to rest in green pastures and beside still waters, restful, reassuring. Sheep don't drink from dangerous, swift-flowing rivers. This shepherd finds just the right spot for the sheep to rest in order to be restored. But then suddenly, the sky turns dark, clouds gather. We find ourselves in the darkest valley. The pleasant mornings of childhood fade. We look down a gradually darkening corridor toward the end of life. And there to meet us is not a dark abyss of death, but the shepherd. Still, the rod and the staff, the strong arm of the shepherd are a comforting reassurance, even there. As a pastor, I have been impressed. When life draws to a close for someone and it is their turn to walk through the valley, they inevitably reach out for this old, familiar friend, Psalm 23. It isn't simply because they know it by heart. It's, it's because it dares to speak about the end, the dark valley, that, that, and names it as a place where the Good Shepherd comforts us. It's therefore a rare funeral where Psalm 23 has not been invited to speak a word or two over the grave when life made us wonder if God was there for us, if God cared. Oh, it was maternal, paternal Psalm 23 who put comforting arms around us and reassured us of a God who makes and leads and restores, comforts, prepares, anoints, so that in darkness or in light, life or death, we might dwell with God. Good old, familiar, since childhood, reassuring Psalm 23, who speaks of still waters and pleasant green pastures. But wait, a closer look at our old friend reveals something uh, I had not seen before. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's the way I was taught to say this psalm. But a look at the Hebrew reveals that, as is so often the case in the Bible, a word could be translated more than one way. Goodness. Uh, the word goodness has many nuances in the Old Testament. Goodness names all those benefits of God's presence, even in the valley. It's good to know that God stands with us. Uh, mercy, 
Oh, that's a beloved Hebrew word, hesed. The prophets love that word, hesed, often translated steadfast love. Mercy is the word for kindness, fidelity of God, even when we are not faithful. God's goodness and kindness follow us. Well, but the word that surprises me <clears throat> this time through is that word translated as follow. Goodness and mercy, uh, goodness and kindness follow me. It's surprising that to me that the Hebrew could also be translated and most often is translated when it occurs in the Bible not as follow, but as pursue. Goodness and mercy pursue me. Say in Exodus 14, 8, Pharaoh's chariots pursued the children of Israel to the sea. Or Psalm 18, 37, I pursued my enemies and I overtook them, sang David after he had triumphed. Our pursuers were swifter than the vultures. They chased us on the mountains. They lay in wait for us in the wilderness. Lamentations 4. Surely goodness and mercy pursue me all the days of my life. Hmm. Try it translated that way. And for me, even in the presence of good old friend about whom I thought I knew everything, there's a ripple on the still waters. Pursue me? Here we are, plodding through life, and, and oh yes, uh, who's that behind me? Oh yeah, that's predictable goodness and, and mercy. They're following me, tagging along. Hmm, L looks, looks to me like, uh, looks to me like maybe they're not simply following you. They may be pursuing you. Is it follow or pursue? You make the call. It, it's somewhat the same thought as it is in that wonderful poem. I fled him down the nights and I fled him down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthian ways of my mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him, from those strong feet that followed followed after that great poem, The Hound of Heaven. <laughs> There's a difference between being followed and being pursued. There's a difference between looking over back over your shoulder and finding dear old predictable goodness with mercy in tow trudging up the hill behind you. There's a difference in that and being jumped by breathless goodness and mercy. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, we say. The shepherd leads us down to the quiet level pasture, knows where to find the quiet, restful brook whereby we can rest and be refreshed. Yeah, but remember Jesus also told us about the shepherd who, when just one stupid sheep strayed from the fold, left the ninety and nine out in the wilderness, and pursued the one lost sheep until he found it. The shepherd pursued until he found the lost. I lay down my life for the sheep, said Jesus. Is there no limit to God's pursuit of us, even unto death? We we knew him uh, as a mean old man, resentful, bitter. Someone said that his bitterness was justified. His beloved wife died giving birth to their one child. The child died shortly thereafter from complications. He has reason to be bitter, they said in town. He never went to church, ne never had anything to do with anyone. And when, in his late sixties, they carried him out of his apartment and over to the hospital to die, nobody visited. Nobody sent flowers. He went there to die alone. 
but there was this nurse. Well, she wasn't actually a nurse, just a, a, a student nurse. She was in training, and because she was in training, she didn't know everything that they teach you in school about the necessity for detachment, uh, the need for some distance between you and the patients, boundaries. <laughs> she befriended the old man. It had been so long since he had friends, he didn't know how to act with one. He told her, go away, leave me alone. She would smile and try to coax him to eat his jello. At night, she would tuck him in. Don't need nobody to help me, he would growl. Soon, though, he grew so weak, he had not the strength to resist her kindness. Late at night, after her duties were done, she'd pull up a chair and sit by his bed and sing to him as she held his old, gnarled hand. And he looked up at her in the dim lamplight and wondered if he saw the face of a, of a little one whom he never got to see grow up to be an adult. And a tear formed in his eye when she kissed him goodnight. And for the first time in 40, maybe 50 years, he said, God bless you. And as she left the room, two others remained whispering softly, in the old man's ear the last word he heard before slipping away into that dark valley. And the word was, gotcha. Whispered in unison, by goodness and mercy. Now we, we wandered down crooked paths, we bobbed like jetsam down some raging river, He's only to find that he meets us there. He has pursued us, even into the dark valley.